There is no threshold that makes us greater than some of our parts, no inflection point at which we become fully alive. We can't define consciousness because consciousness does not exist. So of course the question is why does that happen? And we don't have the answers because to our scientific model, when people have died, there should be no more conscious awareness going on. Uh, but it sounds like maybe consciousness is able to continue. And by that, I don't mean that they're awake, but that entity that makes us who we are, makes Sam who he is, makes Rena who she is, the self, the mind seems to continue and doesn't become annihilated after a person has gone through their process of death. And on days where I feel like I'm weighed down by stress, I decide before falling asleep to become lucid and go to space. I travel upwards, going beyond the atmosphere, and look down on Earth from up there. I feel pretty small then, like nothing else really matters, not even me. It really is fascinating how small we are compared to the vastness of the universe. In lucid dreams, none of the laws of physics apply. So I, I was kind of naive when I was re researching this stuff. Yeah. And um, I started turning into practice. And um, I had an experience where I was literally outside of my body. And I... During meditation? Not during meditation, no. I was having a lucid dream. Mm -hmm. You're conscious in your dream. Now, is that yeah. called uh, astro travel? Yes, astral travel. Okay. Yeah. Lucid dream what that is. Lucid dreaming is not is not astral travel. Some might say it is. Um, it's really not. Uh, lucid dreaming is when you are in a dream and your awareness sets in and you're you're fully conscious that you're dreaming, and you have the state of awareness you have now. Only you're you're aware that you're within a dream world. And I was having one of these dreams. I used to have them all the time when I was in the occult. And um, I remember having a thought in my head: This is so real. I can't distinguish this from real life anymore. That's because neuroscientists are still trying to decipher the human brain. Think of consciousness as the thing that flickers to life when you wake up in the morning. This awareness of what it is to be you. One of the big open questions in neuroscience, and this has been an open question since probably the 1930s or so, is the question of could you build something like a computer or any kind of mechanical device that becomes conscious, that becomes sentient. We are made up, as far as we can tell, we're just made up of pieces and parts. They're very sophisticated biological pieces and parts, but fundamentally, each is just following its rules of physics and chemistry, the lowest potential energy, and so everything is driving everything else, and it's just a machine. So in that way, we think it might be possible to build a machine that is conscious, because we are the existence proof. The flip side of that is that we just don't have any sense of how that would go. In other words, we don't have any theories that explain what consciousness is. We just haven't figured out all the secrets to it yet. Now I'm researching mind science and different anomalies in human consciousness that seem to correspond to this idea of consciousness being a field rather than something created in the brain. And so you're digging into different religions at this point? I'm digging into different, yeah, different religions, yeah. Um, but it, 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 through the lens of New Age, I really, really wanted to know. I was really hungry and thirsty for the truth. I figured, you know, I have one life to live. This is a really weird place. Human consciousness is, is amazing. It obviously didn't originate out of a rock seven, you know, seven billion years ago when a lightning bolt hit it, like we're told in, you know, uh, abiogenesis, the natural explanation. It's like, that doesn't make sense. Some intelligence is responsible. What is it about the human brain that makes it so hard to map onto AI? You know, the thing to keep in mind is there are almost a hundred billion neurons. Those are the specialized cell type in the brain. Each one of those has about 10,000 connections to its neighbors. So there's, you know, almost a thousand trillion connections in the brain. One moment I'm with a little girl. Next time back in Sweetwater. I can't tell which is real. The concern is that the host will remember some of their experiences and act on them. The brain's ability to remember is critical for its capacity to simulate the future. So uh, it turns out that a big part of what intelligent brains do is they're constantly simulating possible futures, as in, if I do this, then this will happen. We spend most of our time unhooked from the present moment and simulating futures or reminiscing about the past. In this way, you know, memory, being able to reconfigure the circuitry of the brain and write things down about what happened is critical. This is a test. 
one we've done countless times. What are you testing for? Fidelity. What happens when we die? It's a question that humanity has wrestled with throughout history. But a new study conducted by NYU may have found some answers. Imagine having a near-death experience where you leave your physical body but remain conscious. Is this the afterlife? Thanks to cutting-edge science, there are tools to measure those accounts. And there are some stunning consistencies. When people die, essentially it's when the heart stops. So this has been going on for as far as we know, millennia, not longer. And when the heart stops, you stop breathing and your brain shuts down and that's how we declare people dead. And that's why we give a time of death and we give them a note. And really, to be honest with you, until about 50 years ago, that was the point of death. So people become lifeless, motionless, the brain shuts down. But now through advances in medicine, we can actually bring people back to life even after they've gone beyond that threshold of death um, and study what happens to them. Ultimately, not only will research help patients survive and recover, it will also shed light on the enduring mystery of what really happens after we die. And one of the interesting things, of course, is that the brain completely shuts down, as I said. But what's fascinating is that the cells inside the body, and particularly the cells inside the brain, do not suddenly become annihilated. They go through a process of decay that can take a few hours, which is why we can actually medically bring people back to life after they have technically gone beyond that threshold of death for tens of minutes, if not hours of time afterwards. And that, of course, raises many interesting questions about what happens when we die. While the research is ongoing, members in the near-death community believe that science and medical professionals are becoming more accepting of the concept. And I have to say, if anything, it gives us hope that there's this peace. Yeah. And he also says that it's not a religious thing necessarily, you know, that this is a medical study to see what people hear and see. And, and the, the um, images are put in places where you'd have to be on top of the room, yeah. not laying in the like bed. Like an aerial wow. view. So, exactly. It's interesting to see the science. We talked about what you feel inside, but it's interesting mm -hmm. when you see how the brain operates. Mm -hmm. So that's part of what we're studying now is does everybody have this experience? And how long does mind and consciousness continue in some format even though we've gone beyond the threshold of death. Do you have some sort of conclusion as to how far the mind and consciousness goes? Again, from what we can determine, which yeah. is actually uh, fascinating and it raises questions about our whole science, about what yeah. happens when we die, is that it appears that even though people have gone beyond that threshold of death and their brain has shut down, that entity that we call consciousness, the mind, the psyche, whatever you want to call it, does not seem to become annihilated. From the evidence we have, that at least tens of minutes, if not hours of time afterwards, mm -hmm. how long beyond that, we don't know at this point. In HBO's critically acclaimed sci-fi series Westworld, robots fight to free themselves from human control as humans experiment with using these robots to become immortal. For three years, we lived here in the park, refining the host. Myself, a team of engineers, and my partner. His name was Arnold. He wanted to create consciousness. As the show suggests, the robots have attained a measure of consciousness, the central idea of which has moved from whether consciousness can be artificially manufactured to whether we can preserve human consciousness by printing it onto AI. In real life, we've only just begun to understand where human consciousness comes from. What does lucid dreaming even mean? A lucid dream is when you're aware you're dreaming in a dream. That seems kind of confusing, so when you explain that to other doctors, it's like talking about aliens. Half the doctor's like, I believe it. The other half is, uh-uh. But you have all these patients in between that some stories are believable, but some of them, I just don't know. Okay. Have you ever had a dream where it's so just odd? It's like you're being chased by yes. water buffalo in the hospital, or the classic one is you're flying. Being able to control landscapes, basically feeling heavenly and being aware of it is how I would define lucid dreams. Every single one of your fantasies is achievable. Not only freedom, but sheer happiness are its greatest outcomes. I'm not here to talk about science fiction, nor to refer to Christopher Nolan's movie Inception, with all its representations or misrepresentations of lucid dreaming. I am here to connect my own experience with lucid dreaming to what science says. Similar to metacognition, where one thinks about his or her own thinking, I want you to dream my own dreams. And maybe then you'd want to think or rethink your own, pay attention to tiny details, 
and enjoy higher levels of self-awareness or actualization. You start using the canvas or the platform of the lucid dream to gain insights and access to levels of mind which in the waking state are often inaccessible. Lucid dreams expose our most innovative side because of the free flow of concepts or ideas arising from our subconscious. Now, to get into the lucid dream realm, you need to learn to distinguish between reality and fantasy. In other terms, between being awake and dreaming. When you recognize dreams as what they are, you can become lucid. And I was having one of these dreams, I used to have them all the time when I was in the occult, and um, I remember having a thought in my head, this is so real, I can't distinguish this from real life anymore. Wow. And after I had that thought, I was, in my, I was driving my car in my lucid dream, I was pulled up out of my car, and I was hovering over the housetops in my lucid dream, um, like 40 or 50 feet in the air, and then above, in front of me, like 20 feet away from me, um, there was a red being and he was he looked like re he looked like a reptile he was disgusting looking and he had red skin black markings on his face red cloak and he was staring at me um he, he had pulled me up out of my car and he was looking at me and we looked at each other for maybe three or four seconds and he had a third eye <laughs> between his, his two eyes eye, yeah. he had a third eye his third eye which is kind of the eye in, in, in the new age when it represents like enlightenment and psychic power he opened his third eye at me and kind of like pulled me into it and it sounds crazy, but that's what happened. And then when I, it was like darkness for like three seconds. And then when I opened my eyes, I was back in the natural, except I was hovering over my body three feet, four feet in the air. And I was lighting up my room. And I sat up in the air and realized I'm floating right now. And I looked around my room and I'm, I'm, out, I'm out of body. I'm having an out of body experience. Right. And then I fought to get back into my body for the next four or five minutes. And I could see my light leg, my spirit man leg. I don't even know what we would call it in, in Christianese, if yeah. you will. Yeah. Something was bouncing in and out of my physical leg. I could see them both. And um, finally, I got back into my body, got pulled out again when I didn't even want to come out of my body, got pulled out so again. You have no control at this point. No control. I'm trying to get in and I can't. And once I finally do, I get yanked out again. Wow. And, you know, in the New Age movement, it's this garbage lie that as long as you say affirmations, you'll be protected. Visualize white light around yourself because if there are negative astral entities, which is what their euphemism for demons, yes, um, they uh, they kind of respect your free will. They can't do anything unless you allow them to. That's garbage. Yeah. The minute you yield to any type of sin, yeah, they have legal right into your life. You know, you've forsaken the commandments of God. And now you're in a new spiritual territory with a new set of rules and your free will, your desires don't really matter. Um, they don't have to obey your free will. Nope. And so I, I realized I didn't have control, but I finally <laughs> got back into my body, realized I'm, I was just out of my body. The fact that people can lucid dream is not under dispute. Literally speaking, lucid means clear, but it's not only about clarity, but more about control. So the question is whether or not we can control our dreams to an extent that they become clear enough for us to start enjoying the adjective lucid. Some scientists such as Daniel Erlacher answers this question with a definite yes. Okay, but now you've seen this guy, this demon. Now I've seen this guy. And how are you, like, what, what, what's your thoughts about what you've just seen with this guy? I mean, where do you think he's from? Do you think he's a demon? The devil. I, I don't necessarily think he's a demon. No, I, I, that didn't really clue into me. I, I figured he could have been a bunch of things. He could have been a spirit guide. Mm, oh he could yeah. have been could have been just some entity living in the astral realm. Which those are, these are all demons, listeners. By the yeah, way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He could have been. I asked someone at a New Age event one time. He could have been a Native American spirit that was. But he sort looked of, like a reptile. He looked like a reptile, but it could, he could have had. They were saying his skin could have been red and it could have been painted. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really know how to understand that. And this is common in the new age movement to, to experience these kind of experiences all the time, all the time. Some, you know what? A lot of the material in the new age movement, you go to a, a, a book, a bookstore, you look at the new age section. A lot of the material you'll see there is what's called channeled material. Mm -hmm. It's actually given by these entities. So people go into a trance like state of consciousness, right? They reach out to what they believe are aliens or spirit guides. And then they're writing things down as this information's coming through. And hence you have doctrines and demons. 
the doctrines of demons, First Timothy 4, 1, right? Yes. And it's in all the channel material that's oriented away from Christ. They're going out of their way to tell you how to understand Christ, what the church got wrong, what early Christianity got wrong. That was always a red flag for me. Why are they obsessed with explaining away Christian, Christian fundamentalism? Really? Oh, yeah. Dude, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it is crazy. Because I've met a couple psychics and, and girls that have come out of it, but they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, we never had a problem with Jesus. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Because where they paint the picture of Jesus. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it's this subtle deception where they take him off the throne that he rightfully belongs on as exalted man god and they lower him down to the level of teacher just a teacher of course he's a teacher but they'll say he was just a teacher he was just a prophet of many many others of buddha of krishna of of gandhi all these guys had something to offer they were all expressing the same christ consciousness the same god consciousness that jesus had and you know what if we want to talk about you know pervasiveness in the culture these aren't small beliefs so the idea so christ christ became christ by emanating christ consciousness so there's jesus the man and then there's christ which is a state of highly enlightened consciousness where you're now aware of your implicit unity with god and they would say that that state of consciousness is something that uh you know men all throughout history have had you know jesus is not unique he's not the first he's not the last people have this all the time and oprah winfrey actually has gone on the record saying i could i could have the actual quote with me i should have brought it saying that you know i used to believe she's saying this to her live studio audience she's answering a question from the audience saying i used to believe jesus came and died for my sins and everything like that um but then i realized through reading some of this other material wow. that what he was really doing was teaching us how to access the infinite christ consciousness that is in each of us that's how i understand him now and you know this is Oprah Winfrey. Okay, yeah. this is one of the most influential, influential people in the world. Yeah. You know, in the last hundred years, easily, teaching this doctrine of Christ consciousness that man's divine, and Christ was trying to teach man how to access his own divinity. Um, and it's these books that they pick up, and which is the doctrines of demons, and it just opens it. It just takes away the deity of, of Christ. It does. It takes away the deity of Christ, or it it um, it. Uh, they, some will affirm the deity of Christ, but they'll supplement that by adding in, well, everything is divine. Everything. Everything's deity. Yeah. There's nothing that's not deity. So Jesus isn't that special. Yeah. Um, so basically this, this I, was in, I was in school at the time, a university, uh, to be a philosophy major. And after that astral projection experience, I went into class and they were having a debate. It was ancient Greek, uh, Greek and Roman philosophy. They're having a debate about the existence of the soul. And I was like really satisfied and felt like I had really tapped into something special that God was leading me down the right track because these questions that mankind has been asking for thousands of years, I just found out, you know, a few hours ago, I just found the answer. Yes, the soul exists. Yes, it can disconnect from the body. I just experienced it. I thought in, that, the, in a classroom, I didn't say that I was thinking <laughs> it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was thinking it. Um, so that ended up turning into, uh, I needed to create some social media platform where I could start sharing my research, okay. sharing this stuff. And the t stuff I'm describing, this was just like the tip of the iceberg. I really got into some weird alternative science, pseudoscience. And so I was like getting asked by my brother's friends a lot about chakras, about reincarnation. And I was like, okay, I need to put this all in one place where I can write articles and just put it out there to the world. And within, you know, a year and a half my facebook page grew to 500,000 likes that's amazing yeah it was crazy and uh that was because i had really big it was, I was part of a network online there was other new age pages that were all just exploding because people people are searching yeah people are searching you know, you know it says you know we're all made in the image of god and it says in ecclesiastes 3:11 that god's put eternity into the heart of man so right you so know I'm searching for that Right. C.S. Lewis says that um, something to the effect of the fact that our heart yearns for something beyond this world proves that this is not really our home. And everyone's built with that. Everyone has that. And in fact, the, the, the posts that ended up doing the best were ones about the nature of the afterlife. You know, um, things like reincarnation, what happens when you die? Does heaven or hell exist? Um, because people there are searching, at least, you know, at any rate, so this particular study is the largest study ever carried out in the world. It was done in 15 medical centers across the US and in Europe. And we studied more than 2,000 people who'd gone through this cardiac arrest or process of death. 
And we did not expect people to have any consciousness or, or awareness, mm -hmm. but intriguingly, up to 40% of people came back and had had a perception of being aware of what was happening to them, even though they had technically gone beyond the threshold of death. Why do you think that is? Well, there's a lot to it. Um, I should also add that among that group, 10% had a very deep, profound, mystical experience that was very true to them. But interestingly, 2% actually had full awareness, could describe all the events that were going on that were validated. Have the, for the folks who have lost consciousness and come back, have there been any long-term effects afterwards? Well, those people who have these very deep, profound, mystical experiences, mm -hmm. often they describe a, a sensation of being very peaceful, seeing a bright, warm, welcoming light, sometimes deceased relatives. And intriguingly, some of them describe a sensation of uh, a being that they describe as being perfect and full of light and love and compassion. Those who have that experience are often very positively transformed for the rest of their lives. It's very profound, really? it's real to them. They become less afraid of death, they lose their fear of death completely. They engage in altruism, they're more uh, helpful to people, they engage more with family. It completely changes them. So there's something very profound about this experience that they have. I, th I thought, <laughs> I was searching, but I set up parameters in which I wanted to search. Yeah. I defined those boundaries and said, within these boundaries, I'm going to search. You know, I didn't want to open up the Bible and read the Gospels as part of my searching. I just didn't do that because I knew something in there was going to convict me and confront my lifestyle, my worldview. Nobody wants to do that in the New Age movement, really, because that's nobody wants to deny Christ. They just want to redefine Christ and then accept him. Everyone knows that Jesus is the man. He's wow. the figure. It's that's kind of the general. They'll say like he, they put him on a pedestal. They really, really do. Um, but they just redefine him so they don't have to really submit to, you know, some of the best-selling books of all time. Um, things like the Celestine Prophecy, you know, 30, 40 million copies. Um, they're New Age books. Like when, when you look at surveys that have come out recently, um, we see that 40% of Americans meditate at least once a week. That's crazy. Break down. What is, what is the downfall of meditation? What does it do? <laughs> the downfall. there's Christians that meditate. Yeah. I, meditation class. The worst, I mean, I guess the, the real primary concern with it is, well, obviously the Bible tells us to fill our minds with the things of Christ, all things that are wonderful, all things that are pure, think on these things, yes. right? Nowhere does it say, sit there, empty your mind of everything, empty your mind of all belief, empty your mind of all concern, empty your mind of all, uh, all content, let all your defense systems down, never address anything that comes up, and just sit there. And when you're just sitting there, you have no defense systems. How can I be sober-minded and vigilant because the devil's a roaring lion seeking to devour whom he may? How can I be vigilant and careful? How can I cast down every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God if I'm all these thoughts against the knowledge of God are pouring in and I'm training myself to not sit there and just let them be? You're trained 100% against what the Bible teaches. Yeah, you're trained to you're trained yeah. to cast down every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, right? You're not but the new age movement will tell you when you're meditating and thoughts come into your mind, just let them be. Or as Ram Dass will say, love your thoughts. When they come up, love them, don't judge them, love them. And the Bible says, no, you're supposed to cast out. Cast out you know, cast down vain imaginations, you know? You're supposed to test these things against scripture. And you're desensitizing your conscience and you are letting down your defense systems for demonic influence, whether it be thought or just spirit. I mean, it's a pagan practice. You can't be in a position like that, do something the Bible tells us not to do and think that you're gonna be exempt from demonic influence, but. That is, that is legit though, because the enemy has come to deceive. He's the father of lies. Yeah. He's the dragon of old. He. He will deceive you. You, will, you won't even know you're deceived. This is for the listeners. You won't even know you're deceived, but the enemy will come in subtly. It starts just... Dude, think about how subtle it started. You're watching TV at home. Just this, this show on TV, and then now look at the years of what, what, the saint, what Satan did. Started deceiving you to mm -hmm. where you're at. Now you're having mm -hmm. outer body experiences, mm -hmm. and I can imagine so much other stuff happening. Mm -hmm. And then you're just popping this verse saying, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That is deception at its finest. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, it says in uh, 2 Corinthians 4 that Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelievers lest they should see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I was blind. Like, I literally could not see. I didn't have the Holy Spirit. I didn't have spiritual discernment from God. I did know and, and sensed intuitively that um, 
there's something there's something more to Jesus, yep. which everyone generally everyone you know you know what. The Bible says in Romans one that uh, God has clearly revealed Himself in nature, even His um, what does it say His internal nature and divine power, such that no, no man has an excuse. Man's without excuse. Right. We have one one general re- revelation of Him in nature, the things that have been created, and a second general re- revelation of Him in, in conscience in the law that's been written on our hearts. And so when we hear the words of Jesus, when we uh, sense his presence, our spirit man is like, that's my maker. That's my creator. Like, that's not just another guy. That's the one who made everything. He's Lord over everything. I think there's something implicit in us that no- recognizes the voice of its maker. You know what I mean? It recognizes the voice of its father, even if it's been alienated and estranged through sin, which it has been. Um, we've been cut off from relationship with God such that, you know, it says we're dead in trespasses and sins. It says that, you know, we're even in Hebrews, you know, it says we're illegitimate sons, you know, yep. because we were, we belong, we're the, we're, we're the sons of someone else, right? Ephesians 2, we're um, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. I was a son of disobedience, but I didn't know it. I had absolutely no clue. I thought I was the son of God. We're all, we're all God's children relationally. And I thought I was doing his will. And during this time, I'm absolutely morally depraved, absolutely morally perverse. My conscience is seared. I'm living a double life. I can lie to people straight to their face and feel nothing. Really? Yeah. I can hurt people and feel nothing. I, um, I got used in my teenage years. I got used to silencing the voice of my conscience. And when, when the new age movement, you know, Part of the new age movement tells you to disidentify from your feelings and from thoughts in your consciousness really because what they'll say is you are the background awareness that is aware of what's going on within the play of consciousness there's something beyond the thinker and the activity that is aware that these things are occurring and so you don't want to you want to identify with the observer and just rest as the presence of pure consciousness and rest as the observer you don't want to get into you know the thoughts and figuring out all these things it's just the mind being the and mind that's where the holy ghost start, is is constantly drawing you sure you know that's, from a young age it's, it's always that holy spirit because you know the job of the holy ghost is to draw people to himself yep so you're there's the, they're teaching you how to shut down oh yeah the holy ghost how to shut down the holy ghost and how to shut down your own conscience your own conscience when your own conscience is telling you hey like you shouldn't you shouldn't do that you shouldn't be saying that you get used to snapping out of it and saying no that's a judgment that's just a label um that's just the ego and so you do get used to silencing the voice of your conscience dude that's crazy yeah wow yeah i would definitely like to encourage people uh into <laughs> no just stop suppressing the truth in unrighteousness that's really what it all comes down to is that we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We know that the God revealed to us in nature is not just some abstract general idea of God. It's a personal God, it's a personal intelligence. And we all have this intuitive knowingness that the one who made everything is somehow connected to Jesus Christ. I would encourage people to seek him out. The Bible says whoever seeks shall find, whoever knocks the door shall be opened unto him. Jesus says, I will by no means turn away those who come to me. Right? It says, when you seek me with all, you heart, with all your heart, you will surely find me. 